just heard on any radio or TV around Valentine's Day, and it's all you find. People want to know about this crazy little thing called love. The most confusing, wonderful, gut-wrenching, undefinable emotion of the human experience. But as we flip through the stations this month, that hasn't stopped many a lucky or unlucky in love from trying to define it anyway. True love is the greatest thing in the world. Except for a nice MLT, a mutton lettuce and tomato sandwich when the mutton is nice and lean. Overrated. Biochemically no different than eating large quantities of chocolate. Is there something to that? Can love be quantified along biological desires like hunger or chemical reactions like that, scientifically? Or to put it more elegantly, what is love? to answer the great bard Hathaway, while we don't understand the whole puzzle of what makes the book of love, from genetic to psychological to cultural influences, we do indeed have some understanding of the neuroscience involved. Many scientists break it down into three rough categories that we'll call here lust, infatuation, and attachment. And of course, whether you like it or not, you'll hear about all of them across the airwaves all month. When we lust for people, in scientific terms, that's just our evolutionary drive to perpetuate the species. The endocrine system, our body's hormone regulation system, comprises, in part, our pituitary gland and hypothalamus. These stimulate our sex hormones, like testosterone and estrogen, regulating our desires for sexual gratification, and therefore, in a more clinical sense, our innate urge to produce more little baby humans to create the next generation. As far as infatuation goes, this is that feeling in that first honeymoon phase with a partner when you're just crazy about them, can't keep your mind off them. The brain plays a major role here. MRIs have shown that the reward centers of the brain light up when people are shown photos of someone they're deeply attracted to. High levels of dopamine and norepinephrine, some of the brain's major reward and fight or flight chemicals, are released when spending time with loved ones which can make us excitable, giddy, and physically feel our heart race. And conversely, it seems that serotonin, another neurochemical associated with mood regulation and a sense of control, is actually lowered during this phase. There's thought this could influence that early relationship feeling of almost compulsive infatuation, of not being totally in control. God only knows what I'd be without you. Our last phase is calmer, long-term attachment. And as we all know, not every relationship makes it there. And there's some reason for that. Once the body grows some tolerance to the spikes of lust and attraction, and some of the chemical levels normalize, sometimes there's nothing to keep it together. In long-term relationships, however, other neurochemicals come into play, like vasopressin and oxytocin. Oxytocin is sometimes nicknamed the cuddle hormone, and is involved in bonding, regardless of a romantic aspect. For instance, it is released during sex, yes, but also with hugging, childbirth, and breastfeeding, too. Of course, there's a downside to all those happy chemicals, too. These same neurochemicals that can keep us coming back to vices like gambling or drugs can be at play when it comes to things like coming back to a bad relationship, unhealthy emotional dependency. And sexual arousal, probably not surprisingly, is associated with a deactivation of parts of the frontal cortex. You know, the decision-making part of the brain. In fact, depending on how you define it, some scientists quite literally classify love's effects on the brain as addictive. Well, it, addicted to love. 
Now, of course, there's plenty we don't understand about the science of love. As indeed, there's still plenty we don't understand about the brain. This isn't a guide for how to go about living your romantic life any more than TV or silly little love songs are. But when it comes to how crazy love can make us, we at least maybe have a little more self-awareness now of how sometimes we can truly be blinded by science. She blinded me with science. For Simply Science, I'm Ari Goldberg.